I'm not worried about today, tomorrow. I'm not worried about $5 on this deal or that deal because the short term isn't the criteria. It's the long term. And so having a, a time frame in decision making that's longer prevents bad decisions. Make certain that the people you're trying to give the message to are interested. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode of Profession Session. I'm Brody Vinson, and I'm on a mission not only to define professional greatness through the tactics and qualities behind it, but also to help anyone that's trying to achieve professional greatness do it through the lens of others that have achieved it before them. I couldn't be more thankful for everyone that helps me continue along this mission through being able to do this podcast. And if you've ever gotten any value out of it, I ask only two things in return. If you could share it in the same way that you found it with someone else that you think could get value, it helps me so much. And if you could also just hit the subscribe button if you haven't yet, it helps me so much in just securing better and better guests for the show to share more impactful knowledge with you in this pursuit that we're both on for professional greatness. So without further ado, let's get on to this week's episode. I'm Brian Hawk. I'm the president of Hawk International. We've been doing exam certification training for almost 25 years. We started in the year 2000, and so we're getting up to the end of our 24th year now. This is something that we've been doing consistently for all of that time period. We've done different exams at different times. We've done some CPA in the past. We've been involved with ACCA and SEMA and CFA. Right now, we're doing CMA and CIA training, providing materials to candidates around the world. We're in the process of making enrolled agent materials available. That'll hopefully be happening in the next month or so. And we're looking to expand back into some exams that we've been involved in in the past and into some new exams. And really what we're trying to do is help professionals achieve their career goals, helping people that are new in their careers, kind of in the middle point of their careers, helping them get to that next step, what it is that they want to do next in their career and helping them have the school, the tools and the skills. And if there's a certification required, that will allow them to do that. So this extends among a, a number of different professions. I know what I saw when I did a little bit of my own research is that it looks like there is a lot around the accounting profession. profession. Um, is that how it started or is that just one of like the biggest areas that you guys operate in? Uh, both, I guess. We started in accounting and that is the biggest area. We've done various accounting certifications. And one of the things about accounting certifications is they apply in different fields. And so if you talk about CPA, it's external auditors are often CPA. Tax professionals are often CPA. If you talk about certified internal auditor, well, the name indicates those are internal auditors that are doing CIA. Certified management accounting is an excellent broad-based certification. Entrepreneurs that are running their own business or would like to run their own business in the future, uh, accounting department, finance department, and so some certifications in the field are a, a kind of a broad application where they they fit, and some are very niche markets. We have, you know, there's a certified fraud examiner, for example, and that's only if you're doing a lot of fraud examination, is that something that is relevant to you? And so ours is internal audit, management accounting, some finance department, accounting function areas is what we're in right now. Very cool. And how, what have been some of the biggest ways you've seen all of this evolve over time? What, how did it kind of just a comparison to when you first started it to yeah. what it's become? <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a long year or a long time to be operating in the field of 25 years. So I'm sure you've seen a lot of change over that time. It's interesting that the changes that kind of jump out to me over that time are technology related and from two different perspectives. One, when I started, the exams were paper and pencil. You showed up at some auditorium somewhere and somebody passed out the paper exam and you took a pencil and colored in the bubbles or wrote your answer down or whatever the case is. And then somebody went and graded it. And so technology has changed now where they're available anytime, really different, you know, some exams have limitations during the year. But it's a computer-based exam. You go to a testing center somewhere and show up, 
prove your identity and take the exam online. Some for a while, there was some opportunities to take your exams at home even. Um, and so IT has changed or technology has changed the way the exam is delivered. And then also even in the content. Um, over the 25 years, accounting standards have changed and tax standards have changed. But, you know, it's all fundamentally the same variations on a theme. But when we look at the content that's covered in the exams, there's a lot more IT than there was 20 years ago. Data analytics, data mining, data security, a big one, and just in terms of making certain that you handle your company's data properly um, and you know what chat GPT is going to be and artificial intelligence and the role of you know computerized automated systems within an accounting function. So accounting, the debits and the credits, the taxes, largely the same. The technology that we use to do those things has changed a lot and will obviously continue to change going forward as well. I like that you went in the direction of kind of bringing up AI, chat GPT, because <laughs> one thing I've talked about with some friends and peers that are in the accounting profession, looking forward to the future of that profession, I think they expect it to change a lot, like you were mentioning there, because of this coming technology. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just knowing how to actually structure a balance sheet, an income statement, et cetera. You, you'll probably be able to do that in a much more automated way. Mm -hmm. So what are the what are the things that accounting professionals or maybe aspirational future accounting professionals need to really focus on getting good at? learning, understanding to be able to stay ahead of that technology? This is a key question for anybody who's graduating or entering into the field. But I think it's something that is the same as it was before in that if no matter who prepares the data, whether it was prepared by a person 20 years ago or whether it's prepared automatically by whatever computer system a company is using today, once that data is prepared, it's what you do with that data that's important. And it's what decision do we make? Or what does this data tell us? And why is this important? Why is this, how do we fix it? Why did this happen? And so, you know, it's something I say that if we're talking about ratios and ratio analysis, I can give you a list of ratios and a company's financial statements, and you can go through and line up the terms and calculate whatever ratio I ask you to calculate, but if you don't know what that ratio means, you haven't added any value to the organization that you're working for. And so for accountants, people that are looking for certification, I mean, not just accounts, any profession, it's how do you use that data to make a decision and to provide value for your organization? And the amount of data that we have grows I don't know if it grows exponentially every day, but it, it's growing. And so it's also a question of what data is important data, what data is irrelevant or not really necessary to what it is that we're doing. And so even though AI and whatever comes next and the different variations of it are going to impact jobs, there's still going to have to be people that use that data and make the decisions and interpret that data and that's that's the skill. Anybody can calculate a ratio. It's who's the person who's best able to understand what that ratio means for the company and what the company needs to do as a result of that information. So I would think that along with that coming change, my my gut reaction says really communication, interpersonal mm -hmm. skills, things like that are going to be increasingly necessary in the profession to really stand out and succeed what other kind of supporting skills do you see being a huge part of that that might not be immediately evident to someone entering the field well i think you hit the you nailed the word communication uh whether that is communication in the form of a formal report whether that communication is in the form of a brief message to somebody one of the things that I see is accuracy of communication. And it's something where words have a specific meaning. And so if you start using a term loosely or in a way that isn't the standard use of it, that short message may be completely, I don't know if, if misinterpreted, but 
interpreted differently than it was intended. And so accuracy of communication, the clarity of the communication so that what you're trying to communicate is is a, comes across and becomes that useful information for whoever. And it's something that, I mean, we see even just in providing support, people ask questions that are so cryptic. We don't even know what the question is that they were trying to ask. And so people being able to communicate. And I know that so much communication now is not formal reports. It's texts or chats or whatever it is, but it still has to be, you still need to communicate what it is you're trying to communicate. And that's a skill that needs to be developed as somebody goes through their career. What are some, so obviously a huge part of the company you've built revolves around content, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, looks like a lot of video content that is meant to inform and educate. What are some mm -hmm. general principles of creating compelling educational content that you've picked up along the way that have been instrumental in being able to accomplish the goal that the company is going for? I think we have a customer base that's around the world and a lot of people that are not native English speakers. And so part of that whole educational process is keeping in mind who your audience is. And so when I teach a topic or present something, depending on who I'm presenting it to, it's a little bit different. And so if I'm in a, in a classroom video where I'm teaching the concepts that are on the exam, we know what it is that somebody needs to know, but it's communication again, being clear, using the terminology in a, in a manner that gives the example, provides the information that somebody needs. But if you have the same conversation with a room full of CFOs, well, the language is going to be different. The depth that you're going to be doing it is going to be different. And so to me, I mean, it's keeping the audience in mind. Who is it that you're talking to? What is it that you're trying to communicate to them? And also what is their foundation? What is their starting point for that? And so when we're making videos to, to teach topics that people around the world are going to be watching. I can't use a local restaurant as an example because not everybody has that same, same context. I know that um, checks, written checks are a lot less used than they were when I was a child, but a lot of countries don't have checks. And so if you start teaching something, assuming that a person already has a background in it, they may not. Um, and, you know, there's a different cultural background, a different way that, you know, money is transacted in different cultures. And so it's a matter of making certain that you don't assume that the audience knows something that perhaps they don't. So uh, sounds like it's really about just continuing to know and understand that audience. And I'm sure it's been probably a challenge just going forward as you've opened new channels and new types of mm -hmm. certifications to continually understand that audience if you were to advise someone that that is looking to engage an audience, especially through some kind of education, maybe they're doing it to supplement a business or maybe mm -hmm. for some other reason, how would you instruct someone in that position to learn their audience and, and understand their audience? In terms of learning your audience, first of all, it's talking to the people that you perceive to be your audience. And it's something that, you know, if any business idea, whether it's education or something, we often assume that what we think and what we need and what we're looking for is what everybody else is looking for. And so we may do something that solves a problem for ourselves. And then you try to sell that to your friends and neighbors and you realize you're the only one who had that problem. Nobody else is, is worried about that. And so if you're just starting, it's a matter of confirming that what it is you're trying to teach, the message you're trying to give, the education you're trying to provide is actually something that people need, that people are looking for, or even if they may not be looking for it, but once they find out about it, hey, that's something I need to know. I'm willing to, to listen to that. I'm willing to spend the time to do that, um, just to make certain that the people you're trying to give the message to are interested. And that's, you know, talking informally, really, before you, you know, as you put something before you make too much of an investment, you want to make certain that there's people out there that are going to, to be interested in that. And a lot of that is friends and family, whatever the business is, you know, and, and people know you, 
And if, you know, something, if, if you say, Oh, I'm going to make a business that I'm going to teach people how to do whatever I'm going to make videos. And, and somebody says, well, you hate public speaking. You, you, why would you do that? And so it's letting the people who know you best help you determine whether or not what you're looking at for your business is something that there's actually a need for. Yeah. And I've found sometimes that you can get valuable market sample research just by talking to people close to you. I mean, if, yeah. if you think you've got a great idea and then you mention it to your wife, your girlfriend, or your, your friend, whatever that may be, and they're, and they, they might have some completely different angle that you hadn't thought of. That's right. a really compelling reason why it's not a great idea or is. Yeah. So I, I think that's very important. That goes back to just communication as well. Well, I think very yeah. open, transparent communication really helps bring a lot of that stuff about. Well, and social media is one too. There you have access to people that have some commonality with you. But again, the the issue too in in getting any feedback is are people being honest? Are people telling you what you think you want to hear? I just was talking with my wife <laughs> yesterday and she said, well, when she hears an idea, her initial reaction is to kind of look for, well, what might not be right or what might be wrong about that or what might make it difficult. And she thinks my initial reaction is, oh yeah, that's great. Let's make it work. Well, but then if I always have a positive reaction, do I always have a positive reaction because I want to, or do I actually have a positive, is it something that I actually feel? And so it's a matter of trying to, it's all that data, all that data that's out there and trying to get the data points that are accurate, the data points that reflect what it is that we're trying to accomplish. Sounds like a good pair between the two of you. You're the yeah. yes guy. You, <laughs> anything goes, everything's a good idea. And she checks your ideas and make sure that they will work. Yep. That's if we awesome. meet in the middle, it always works out. So <laughs> That's awesome. That's what you need. Yep. So um, I want to talk a little bit about your company again. And mm -hmm. obviously, I would say it's it's pretty apparent from an outside view that you know, 25 years of doing it, it's been successful. It's been able to make 25 years. I've got two kind of bifold questions here. Okay. One, uh, just in general, this is a question we had talked about a little bit off air, but curious what success means to you personally. And then by extension, what some of the biggest things that you think have contributed to your company's continued success have been? In terms of what is success, this is something that has actually, I went through a transformation a few years ago and I remember doing it. And that was a trans transition of not looking at revenue as what's important, but looking at the number of students, the number of people that we help. Now, clearly they're connected. You help more people, there's going to be more revenue. You help fewer people, there's going to be less revenue. And so it's not so much a, a difference in what I'm measuring, but it's the perspective of it. It's kind of the mindset of it in that if, if I go into making a video and I do this, when I make a video, I close my eyes and I picture that somebody's trusted me to help them pass this exam. There's topics they don't know, there's content they don't know, and they're, they've decided to trust me with their money and their time to pass this exam. And so I try to picture that person who's studying, who's gonna watch this video, optimistically at the beginning, hopeful that it's going to teach them what they need to know. And so if I keep my focus on the fact that I'm helping people pass their exams, whatever country, whatever age they are, that's what we do as a business is help people pass their exams. The financial success will flow from that. Instead of having a going to bed, oh, well, we didn't have enough sales today or sales are a little bit down. Well, that, you know, okay, that's not good if sales are down for a long period of time, but the metric isn't how much money, but how many people. And the fact that that's what it is that we're doing is helping people. And then in terms of, I think the second part was a little bit a long-term perspective. And that's the answer I want to give is the success comes from not being focused on today, tomorrow, this week. It's a it's a business. The, the you know international holidays affect our sales, and so somewhere there's a holiday that I don't know about, and that impacts our sales. So I'm not worried about today, tomorrow. I'm not worried about five dollars on this deal or that deal because the short term isn't the criteria. It's the long term, 
And if we don't worry too much when things go well this week and not as well next week, but keep the eye on the fact that this is something I've been in it for 25 years, whether I'm in it another 25 years, we'll, we'll see, but I'd like to be. Um, and so having a, a time frame in decision-making that's longer prevents bad decisions. And this is something too, that sometimes we, you know, you say to kids or something that you, you make a long-term solution for a short-term problem. And you don't want to do that. You know, your, your cars, you need to change the oil. So you sell your car. Well, that was a short-term problem, but now you don't have a car. I mean, not the greatest example right off the top of my head, but if we keep in mind that we're looking for a long-term process, you know, every, every week can't be growth. And this is one of the things that always amazes me in the stock market. Everyone expects the company to grow 20% every year. No, we only grew 8% this year. Well, if I'm a business owner and my business grows 8% every year, I'm ecstatic. That's much greater than inflation. Uh, you know, that's wonderful. But when we invest in another company that we don't have any, any influence on, we expect 20% every year, which means that some of the ways that companies get that growth figure this year in profit is to make very short-term HR decisions. You know, I mean, you see now in the news every week, somebody's laying off 10,000 people. And I kind of think, wow, I mean, I understand it's a large organization, but if you have 10,000 people that you don't need as a company, your hiring practices need to be looked at because apparently you're hiring oh, yeah. far too many people. Um, but what happens when the economy recovers three months from now, six months from now, and all of a sudden you need to rehire all of those people? Was that a short-term decision that causes long-term problems? Because your metric isn't the long-term health of the company. The metric you're using is what the analysts on Wall Street think we should do or what the target earnings per share is or whatever the case may be. You said that was a pretty big perspective shift for you recently. How did you train yourself to think differently in that way? Oh, God, I don't I guess it's a part of it just becomes the the conscious decision of of not looking at looking at a customer as a person and not a dollar sign. You know that it's not your revenue to me. You're somebody I'm going to help. And if I can help you pass your exam, you're going to say good things about me. You're going to recommend me to your friends. And so it's just kind of having that a non-financial perspective. And it's interesting. One of the things that um, for performance evaluations. 360 degree feedback or balanced scorecard where companies try to recognize that the whole measure of how a person does isn't whether or not they achieved the budget. It's not only a financial, oh, your department met budget, was under budget, was over budget, and therefore you did well or poorly. Well, there's how did the team go? Did we have high turnover in the team? Did we keep our customers happy? There's a lot of things other than just the bottom line of the income statement and similarly, in a small business, in your own mindset, is the only measure of how you did this year, how much money you made? Or is it what happened with your family? What happened in your, you know, the growth of your career, the opportunities you have, the, the board you volunteer on, or whatever the case may be. So taking that balanced scorecard perspective out of a company evaluation and making that part of your personal evaluation. You know, it's not only the money that's that's important. There's other things as well. Um, obviously, money helps make some of those other things possible, but is money going to be the only thing you want to measure yourself by? Yeah, it seems like if you really find the right things to focus on aside from money, it just the money will come if you're focusing on yeah. the right things. What are some, I mean, it, you mentioned a few that kind of broadly apply what are some other factors that you think just the average business owner or even just professional working in an organization needs to be thinking deeply about as far as metrics that they should be focusing on? When I talk to people, it has to do with time in terms of what is the time frame that we think about. And I understand. I, I remember when I started the business, I had one report and it was a little Excel spreadsheet and it had cash and bank plus money people owed us, minus money we owed people. 
And if that was a positive number, life was good because yeah. there was positive cash. If that number was negative, well, hopefully we got more money before we had to pay it. And so I understand that it, at the beginning, at least, it is a very short term. Is there going to be cash to pay who I need to pay tomorrow? But that shouldn't last a terribly long time because that's no way to run a business that you're always on the the edge. I understand that at the beginning. And so part of it becomes, well, maybe I'm going to not have quite as much profit this year because I'm going to invest in something. I'm going to invest in a new, uh, you know, in marketing, a new employee, a new machine, a new process, whatever the case may be, recognizing that a little investment today becomes a lot more profit tomorrow. And I think a lot of business owners get stuck in the short term. And again, obviously the short term is part of how we have to make decisions and operate. But if we're always operating in the short term and always looking in the short term, we're never going to see, we're never going to see growth because that growth requires an investment. Yeah. And I think one thing I've talked about with business owners before that have had success in really growing the business over a long time horizon is that oftentimes the the types of things that have gotten your business from A to B are not going to get it from B to C or C mm-hmm. to D. And it sounds like many times kind of what you were alluding at there, that could involve some kind of short-term change that you make for the long-term goal. Uh, do you have a particular, any kind of particular systems that you use to assess a potential new opportunity like that and decide on whether it is the right move for your business or not? Well, I do break even analysis and return on investment and things like that. But I guess what may make me a little bit different is what is the time frame I need that return to come in? If I make an investment into a new program or materials or staffing or whatever it may be, is it realistic to expect that return in a week, a month, six months, 12 months? What's the time frame? And so it's a matter of being realistic. We all we want everything to happen immediately. That doesn't always happen. A relationship doesn't happen overnight. It has to be built and nurtured. And there's time for that to take place in order to get that reward or that, you know, the har- harvest at the end of the, of the process. And so it's something, again, time frame. What's the time frame that you're looking at in terms of making that decision? Um, you know, it's something if you say, well, this is going to be profitable in 20 years. Well, that's ridiculous. That's not a time frame that we're interested in. But again, it's not something we should expect 20 days to be the return. And so all of those tools are used. It's just a question of what's the time frame that you use with each of those tools. You know, what's the and I, the other thing too, I remember when I did budgeting years ago, I would make my budget for a project or whatever or the year and I would take my revenue number and divide it by something. And I would take all of my expenses and multiply it. And so if you make your budget And we always tend to be, I think, a little more optimistic than we should be. So make your budget. And if you can then take away 20% of your revenue and add 20% to your expenses, and you're still profitable, you're still close, then you you have a more realistic budget. Um, One of the things I say when people start is I say, whatever you think your expenses are to start your business or in the first year, I guarantee you there's something you missed. You, You just never thought of it. You didn't know it existed. You you go to your first customer and they say, well, what's the business insurance you have? And you say, oh, well, I guess maybe I need that. And so yeah. there's always something that you missed as an expense. And you may think you know who your customers are. You know, if you have a landscaping business or somebody's going to move and you lost your customer, they moved at the beginning of spring. And so the person that you thought you were going to do whatever all summer for you lost that. And so it's a a, a non-business example. When you go to the doctor and the doctor tells you you're sick, you have a problem, you go get a second opinion. But when you go to the doctor and the doctor tells you you're healthy, okay, you trust that doctor. You know, why do you trust the doctor when they say that you're healthy compared to when they say that something's wrong with you? 
And so when we do our budget, we're going to be optimistic, just kind of by nature, I think that, oh yeah, the revenue will be there. Somebody will move into the neighborhood. Well, we need to be a little more realistic about those things. And so it's a matter of taking that into account with your planning. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's a natural reaction to be a little optimistic or lean that way because for the for the thing to work out, you have to have a certain optimism that it's going to work out. Mm -hmm. But I like having that rule and that constraint because what that does really is the the twenty percent on both sides is it kind of builds in for assuming the worst situation or one mm -hmm. of the worst situations, and if you if you can build it such that it'll survive the worst times, then it'll survive the worst times when they come and thrive in the best times when they come. I think something too that I talking to people is you need to know where your second customer is coming from. And I remember years ago, somebody came and said, oh, I'm going to make this business that's going to do financial analysis and I'm going to sell it to banks. And I thought, okay, well, I'm not sure why a bank would pay you to do their financial analysis. So I asked, who, you know, who are you going to, oh, well, my good friend's this person at this bank and he's going to buy it from me. And I said, okay, where's your second customer? I mean, do you have a friend at every bank who's going to do this for you? Because if your business model is based on you have a friend who's going to buy it from you, they better buy a lot or you better have a lot of friends that are going to do that. In, in training, we have people come, I'm going to start a training company. Well, do you have a group of students? Yeah, my colleagues. Okay, that's great that your colleagues trust you to teach them. Where's your second group? Because if you don't have a, a process to find that second customer, the second year, um, well, you, you don't have a business, you have a hobby that you're going to monetize for a short period of time. But it's a matter of where does that second that second customer, second year's worth of customers, whatever the case may be, that ongoing customer base. What are some things that you've learned along the way about customer acquisition that you think are true across all industries? Well, I, I hope this is true, that honesty pays in the long term. That, and I see it in my industry, people post a pass rate. You know, and if you take an exam and you look at all the companies that post a pass rate, they all say 95% pass rate. Well, the exam has a 50% pass rate. So yeah. the math doesn't work that everybody has a 95% pass rate, but overall it's 50%. And so I know there's exaggerations, there's kind of being a little loose with the language or whatever the case may be. But I'd like to think that in the long term, and again, this comes back to the time frame that you're looking at. In the long term, being honest about what you do and what you can't do and being honest about the services you provide ultimately is going to help. It may not get you the first customer because somebody's going to think, oh, well, there's a better pass rate over here. There's a better system over here. But in the end, reality and the, the truth situation is going to come out and people will see, despite the slogan, despite the claims, this is who's actually going to help me get through the exam. I think that makes a lot of sense. And to use the example that you were using there, I think if you've got two companies, right, one that's posting a 95% pass rate and one that's posting a 60% pass rate, something 10% better than the average. And you go somewhat, one customer A goes with the company posting the 95% and they get a 60 or 65, yeah. whatever that may be. And customer B goes with, company B and they get a 60% pass rate. They got what they expected. They got much lower than what yeah. they expected. They're going to tell their friend about it. They're going to yeah. tell their friend to wow. stay the hell away from it. So I think that honesty just really builds a foundation of good word of mouth and good reputation. Yeah. That and carries with, you far. with social media, customers connect with each other that you have no idea how it takes place. And so you may advertise something in whatever field it is, but if you don't deliver that to your customers, there's going to be enough customers out there commenting in whatever platform. And when the next person searches your company, they're, well, they don't quite do what they say they're going to do or, you know, and it, the customers, customers figure out how to communicate with each other. And in time, the reality of the situation comes out. Yeah. I mean, if, 
if they leave one bad review, sometimes that's all it takes. Yeah. You, you have to really live and die by your reputation as a company, I think. Yeah. What is um kind of zooming out again, just general things that have served you well in your career. What is some non-negotiable career advice that you would give to your kids? Integrity, honesty, uh, you know, and one of the things that isn't a little more specific example, but I think the, an underused phrase in the world having to do with honesty is I don't know. You know, people ask you a question and nobody wants to say, oh, I, I don't know how to do that, but let me find out. Let me, you know, I'll, I'll find out how to do that for you. But you, people want to fake it until they make it. Well, too often you don't get to the point where you make it. <laughs> you get called out and just being honest, what you know, what you don't know. Um, every Any supervisor would rather have you say, I don't know how to do that than say you do when you don't. You know, they're happy to teach you, happy to help you learn that skill, whatever it might be. But when you aren't honest about what you know and don't know, it's only a matter of time before you fall off the edge of the cliff. Yeah. And if you're honest about what you don't know, and then you actually do follow up on figuring it out yeah. for the customer, you establish yourself as a problem solver that they can count on going forward to mm -hmm. solve their problems. Take responsibility for what you did. Yeah, good or absolutely. bad you know hey we messed up sorry about that we're gonna here's what we're gonna do to fix it here's what we're gonna do to try to make it right um, but customers customers appreciate honesty you know we just had the case where we were driving two hours to pick something up that we'd ordered we'd gotten an hour there and they called and said we never ordered it i'm so sorry i feel so i know you're on your way here we just we don't have it i feel this is what i'm gonna do it'll be ready this day this is i, I mean yeah you're disappointed you wished you hadn't gone start but you can't be mad at the person they apologize they know yeah. they made a mistake and they told you what they were going to try to do to make it as easy as possible for you uh, don't don't pass it off on somebody else don't blame somebody else and say i messed up this is what this is what we're going to do i love that what is uh what is the next step for your company it's Hawk International is what it is the mm -hmm. entire company, right? What is the right. next step for Hawk International? And what do you hope to see in the next maybe five, three to five years of growth? Well, there's in our business, there's really two ways you can grow. You We have certain products that we sell and we want to grow those, be more successful, get more people into our into our product. And also add more products. We have a, a good system. We have a good process of teaching and helping support candidates as they go through the exams. And so what are the other exams that are in related fields that we have the expertise to, to teach, to provide? And how do we help people do that in, in related fields and similar types of exams? I love it. Yeah, just keep growing on the foundation and the, the principles that you've learned that work in the field. Yeah. I think it makes a lot of sense to just doubling down. Yep. Um, so I have a couple questions that I like to kind of round out every interview with, and these kind of just give like a, a general idea of like what's going on in your career. The first one that I have for you is, so if you could go back in time, let's call it <laughs> the, the beginning of Hawk International. Yep. So you said about 25 or so years ago, if you could go back in time and just talk to a younger Brian <laughs> as he was getting into starting it, just having the the wisdom and the knowledge that you have now that you've gained over the course of that time, having done what you've done, learned what you've learned, what are a couple things that you would tell him to do differently to do it a little bit better and why? Meet more people. It's I mean, everyone talks about networking and it's kind of like a buzzword, but it's reality. It's the, the people that are able to connect you to the person you need or the decision maker you need. And so no matter how many people you think you've met, no matter how many, how well you think you are networking, you know, anybody else you have the opportunity to meet and connect with and, and help. It's not, I think we need to look at networking as a two-way street. Obviously we're looking for things that are going to help us in our business and our career, but that works a lot better if we're meeting people and seeing how we can help them. And what is the contact we know to, to give to somebody? And so just keep meeting people, meet more people and, and think of how it is that you're able to help them. 
And again, that's kind of the longer term perspective. I'm going to help you today. And yeah, maybe in the future, there's going to be an opportunity. You're going to be in a position to tell me. And I want you to do that. I want you to say, hey, I, I met Brian. He did some nice things for me. I'm happy to help out and introduce him to whoever or whatever the case may be. So meet as many people as you can. Um, and and also, there is no small person. There is no person that's not worth meeting. There is no person that, well, they're they're not in a high enough position or that's a temporary situation. I've had plenty of opportunities and experiences in my career where the people that you don't think are the decision makers, the people you don't think, the quiet ones, they are, are the people that are in the position to help you most. And so meet as many people as you can and everybody's worthy of meeting and talking to and getting to know. I love that advice. I think that's so true. I mean, you, you really never know what someone has to offer. I mean, someone yeah. who maybe may seem and may be incredibly inexperienced in one particular field may have some kind of insight that they could offer you into a completely different field that you know nothing about yeah. that is exactly the thing that you needed to hear. Yeah. So that kind of leads into my next question too. And I like this question for you in particular because your company deals with a, a number of different types of professionals, but my show is called Profession Session, and it's because I very much enjoy answering the question of just what a professional is and what it takes to be one. So my question to you is, what does it mean to you and having studied so many professionals and and what it takes to help elevate them, what does it mean to you personally to be a professional? I think that uh, a professional is somebody who's aware of, I won't say their insignificance in the larger picture, but aware that any success that we've had in our careers is built on the help of other people. And that where we are is, is not entirely of our doing. And if we take a professional certification, I'm a CMA. And so that carries weight. People give me the benefit of the doubt, but I didn't do anything to make CMA valued around the world. There were a lot of people for years before me that became a CMA, worked hard, did well, and that reputation was built. And so as a professional, I get to benefit from that. But I'm also connected to everyone else who's a CMA. So my interactions with you, you now know I'm a CMA, you've dealt with me and you have an opinion of that. Next week, you meet somebody and they say, I'm a CMA. And you say, oh, well, I met Brian last week and he's a CMA. So whatever you feel about me is going to color your initial impression of this other person you just met. And so as a professional, we're not by ourselves. We're part of a profession, which means there's other people. We're connected to them. What happens to the profession as a whole reflects back on us. What we do reflects back on the profession. And so it's that um, interconnectedness that we rely on other people and other people rely on us if we're part of a profession and if we're behaving as a professional. It's about more than just me. I like that view of just thinking about breaking down what it what an actual profession is because there's so many different types and mm -hmm. general principles that apply to all of them or most of them. And it's just a, it's understanding that the profession as a whole carries a reputation of its own. That's interesting. I like that a lot. And we're part and of it. And I think <laughs> and we're part of it and should carry ourselves as such and understand what it means in the market. Well, Brian, anything else that you would want to share with the <laughs> audience? I think we've gotten into a, a number of very interesting yeah. topics here. I, to me, I, I guess I've, I've said it enough times. I'll say it one more. I, when we're talking about our career and a profession, a lot of it is what time frame are we looking at? And the more, I mean, obviously, yes, there are short-term decisions we have to make. But when we're looking at our career, our professional development, a longer term time frame is going to lead to ultimately the better decision. You know, it may not be the best short term decision. It may not be the best thing right now, but it's laying that foundation. It's laying that framework. It's making that investment that because we have a perspective that's not just dollars today in our bank account, 
but whatever other part of the balanced scorecard we want to apply to our lives in the future, that's the decision that we need to be making is what's going to do that two years, five years in the future, rather than just this week. I think that's so important. Have a balanced scorecard for your life and be thinking far into the future yeah. beyond next week, next month, even next year. I think that's so important. Yeah. It helps you put into perspective what you actually want your career to look like too. If you're thinking, if you're thinking, am I going to get a promotion next month versus where, where do I want to be in my career in 10 years? It's going to lead to a lot different decision-making and I totally agree that it'll lead to better, better, more informed decision making. Yeah. Because if you can, if you can pick an endpoint, right, and you reverse yeah. engineer from that endpoint back to where you're at now, it's going to give you somewhat of a path of what it takes to get there, whether it's next month or in ten years. But yeah. I think it gives you a lot better, more informed path if you know where you want to be in 10 years. If you don't know where you want to go, it's unlikely you're going to get there. If you keep making sure. short-term career decisions without saying, hey, in 10 years, I want to own my own business. I want to be my own boss. I want to be the director of whatever company. That's how you make your decisions. If you know where it is that you want to go. If you're just, well, hey, I got a chance for promotion. It's in a different city than I want to be in. It's a different industry, but hey, it's a promotion. Well, 10 years from now, you doing something completely different than what it is you thought you wanted to do. Now, maybe what you want to do in 10 years is different, but if you don't know where you're trying to go, it's really unlikely that you're actually going to get there. It's very true. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's the metaphor of like a, a giant ship. And if you've got like an incremental turn every, yeah. every year, it's going to be going in a completely different direction than yeah. if you keep it on course. Yeah. Well, anything else that you would want to share with the audience, Brian? This has been a very interesting conversation. I think um I think the point of the biggest takeaway I got from this was just the thinking in long time horizons. Mm -hmm. And I, I found that to be such a shared principle of the most successful people that I know, especially mm -hmm. people that have been in their career for a while. I think that really rings true. Yeah. I think that's part of you know, big way of how I look at things now is, you know, today's nice, this week's nice, but there's a longer time frame that we're trying to be successful in than what happens today. I agree. Well, how can the audience find you if they want to check out your company, you, what you guys do? Our website is hockinternational.com. Very simple. Um, and if, if you're looking for professional certifications, I'd be happy to help. Um, and I'll, also, I always talk to people to determine whether or not a professional certification is what they need. It may be that what you're trying to do or what you've already done or where you want to go, a professional certification isn't the tool that's part of that steps, you know, part of that process to get, get you to where you want to go. And that comes back to my long term. I'm, I'm not interested in selling materials to an exam a person doesn't need. That, that doesn't help anybody in the long run. You know, it helps me in the short term, but not in the long term. So yeah, it's a good discussion for people to have. Yeah. Yeah. Know who your customers are, but also know who they aren't and be willing to be honest with them if they're yeah. not. Yeah. Sometimes the best service is to say, we can't help you. Yeah. But here's not, who can. Yeah. We're not the ones that are, we're not the best ones for you. This isn't going to do what you want it to do. Yeah. Exactly. Well, Brian, thank you so much for coming on. That's a podcast. Mm -hmm.